The relationship between Rukia and Byakuya is a fascinating topic within Bleach. Their complicated story of becoming siblings and the dynamic between the two of them is a key underlying component of one of Bleach's greatest story arcs, the Soul Society arc. The dynamic or bond between these two characters is not only the greatest indicator of their individual development, but it is also intrinsically tied to their character growth. In this video, I want to delve into the long and complicated history between Rukia and Byakuya and how their relationship evolved evolves throughout the story of Bleach. I will analyze key moments that impact their relationship, including their conflicting beliefs and how they learn to eventually understand and respect each other. Hopefully by exploring their bond, we can gain an insight into the complexities of Bleach's characters and how their growth as individuals is intertwined with their relationships with others. Before the video begins, only 12% of the people who watch my content are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy these videos, then subscribe and stick around for more content just like this. Now let's get back to the topic of the video. Rukia and Byakuya's history is one that spans far beyond their actual introduction to each other. It had all started 55 years before the main timeline, when Byakuya had married Rukia's older sister Hisana. Now on the surface, this sounds like a very harmless development, until you realize that Byakuya is from nobility, and he Hisana wasn't. She was literally from the slums of Rukongai. She had lacked noble blood and she was from one of the poorest, most crime-ridden districts of Rukongai, in Uzuri. When Byakuya had married Hisana, he had broken a cardinal law of the Kuchiki family. This detail becomes a key component going into Rukia and Byakuya's future. Hisana and Byakuya had happily lived together for five years until disaster had struck. Hisana had gotten terribly ill and it was an illness that she wasn't going to survive. In in general, this concept of souls getting sick is very unexplored, so I'm not too sure how Kaido experts like Unohana weren't able to save her, but the point is, she was dying. Before she had died, she had made a final request to Byakuya, that she had a younger sister who she had abandoned a long time ago who was still in Rukongai. Her dying wish was for Byakuya to find and adopt her, and to not treat her as the sister of his late wife, but rather as his own sister. She had said this because she was feeling personally guilty for having having abandoned Rukia all those years ago. Not too long after this, Hisana had died and Byakuya had resolved to carry out her final request. Now this didn't take very long to accomplish as Rukia would enroll into the Shinigami Academy just a year later. Byakuya had found her and adopted her into the noble Kuchiki family as his own sister, making this the second time that Byakuya had broken the laws and customs of the Kuchiki family. After taking this action, Byakuya in full acknowledgement of how much he had broken the law swore to never do it again. You can see that the relationship of Byakuya and Rukia was underpinned by these feelings of guilt that Byakuya had. He felt like he was letting his noble family down, and the weight of his rule breaking would eventually put a strain on their relationship, since he had vowed to never break the rules again. Now understandably, this had impacted the first few years of Rukia being Byakuya's sister. Now let's follow what happens next chronologically in the story, as not too long after this, Rukia was deployed into the world of the living, and she had met Ichigo for the first time. Byakuya and Renji were dispatched to the world of the living in order to bring her back to the Soul Society after she had gone missing for a period of time. Now looking back on this story beat, it's almost funny how cruel of a decision this was, considering that the order had come from Aizen himself, who at the time was impersonating the Central 46. He had decided that the people closest to Rukia should be the ones to bring her back to the Soul Society for her to be killed. It's quite a twisted thing to do, but what else do you expect from Sosuke Aizen? During the retrieval mission, it's the first time that we see Rukia and Byakuya interact with each other. He is extremely cold and nonchalant towards her, as he implies that Rukia feels a connection towards Ichigo because of his physical similarity to Kain Shiba. Now, this seemingly kind acknowledgement is followed by a threat to cut off Ichigo's hand, even after acknowledging and understanding why Rukia must care for him. Rukia prevents her older brother from hurting Ichigo by kicking away his hand. Now, after Byakuya casually defeats Ichigo and they return to the Soul Society, she is immediately imprisoned. Now in chapter 59, we are able to understand Rukia and Byakuya's relationship better when Renji visits Rukia while she is imprisoned. He informs her that Byakuya is at the captain's headquarters, and he is likely lobbying for her sentence to be reduced. He confidently says that as her older brother, there is no way that he was going to stand by and watch her get killed. But Rukia is surprisingly unmoved by this statement, as she reveals that if anything, Byakuya was going to kill her himself. 
himself. Now this surprises Renji, but then Rukia makes a rather peculiar statement that in the 40 years that she has lived with the Kuchiki family, Byakuya has not even looked at her once. There is so much to derive from this statement made by Rukia, as it signifies how Byakuya had never regarded her as an actual person, yet failed to recognize her existence as worth noting. Now despite being fully aware of this, Rukia had remained respectful and loving towards him. Now this inability to acknowledge Rukia as an individual becomes the struggle that their relationship must overcome. Now despite this, it's worth noting that Byakuya didn't do this out of malice, but out of fear. A fear that will be explained during the course of this video. Now we move on towards the end of the Soul Society arc during Byakuya's battle against Ichigo. Now after Ichigo stalemates Byakuya, he reveals that the reason that he had supported Rukia's execution was because he had sworn to never break the law again after he had broken it twice. But Ichigo's conviction makes Byakuya reconsider how he has been behaving towards Rukia. After all, it would seem that his desire to abide by the law had come into direct conflict with the promise that he had made to Hisana. After all, an important part of her final request was for Byakuya to treat her like his actual sister. But this entire time, he had treated her like an outsider. Now, following Aizen's betrayal, Ginichimaru actually attempts to kill Rukia, but Byakuya intercepts the attack and he takes it upon himself to protect her, indicating that his oath to Hisana supersedes his desire to uphold the law. Now, this act leads to a heart to heart conversation between Rukia and Byakuya, where he reveals the truth about her origins and he apologizes for his past actions. The two reconcile and rekindle their bond as brother and sister as Rukia transforms from being a mere reminder of Byakuya's broken oath to something else entirely. However, the question remains was this change for the best? As the story progresses into the Aranka arc, we get another insight into how much the dynamic between these two characters has evolved. After a handful of captains are sent to Huekomundo in order to support Ichigo and his friends, Byakuya immediately rushes to Rukia's rescue. He intercepts the seventh Espada, who was just about to kill an unconscious Rukia who had just defeated Aronyaro. Now, during Byakuya's battle against Zomari, he expresses nothing but absolute concern for Rukia's safety. He uses a harmless propulsion Kido in order to push the unconscious Rukia out of the range of their fight, and so that Hanataro could tend to her wounds. During their fight, Byakuya's focus was on keeping Rukia safe, but this ends up making her a target for Zomari, who takes control of her body with his ability Amor. Now, while under his control, Rukia cuts down Hanataro, making Byakuya rush to his aid, but Zomari quickly responds by making Rukia aim her blade at her own throat. He threatens to make Rukia kill herself if Byakuya so much as moves. Zomari then orders him to drop his sword immediately. As his sword nears the ground, he quickly points his hand at Rukia and casts Bakuda 61 as he restricts her movements. He then activates his Bankai which overwhelms Zomari, who questions the Shinigami's authority to kill Hollows. But Byakuya responds by stating that he's killing him not because of his duty as a Shinigami to kill Hollows, but rather that the Espada had dared to point his sword at his pride. Now, this statement reveals just how much Rukia means to Byakuya and how his love for her has evolved over time. He has in fact finally acknowledged her as his sister. This battle alone is a massive display of character growth as Byakuya shows zero regard for his own safety as he refuses to allow anything to hurt Rukia. It's a massive improvement from when he had actively supported her execution during the Soul Society arc. Now Rukia has become a part of his very being as he refers to her as his pride that he wishes to protect. I personally feel that while this was a great scene, I think that this was simply just Byakuya switching from one extreme to the next. Now he had gone far beyond acknowledging Rukia's existence and he had seemingly assimilated her as a part of himself. But I believe that Kubo did this on purpose because the growth doesn't just stop there. During the events of the Fullbring arc, it is revealed that Rukia had become the Lieutenant of Squad 13 during the 17 months following the defeat of Aizen. Now this detail is significant towards the evolution of Rukia and Byakuya's relationship because it was Byakuya who had previously used his influence to prevent Rukia from being promoted and to ensure that she remains as an unseated officer of the 13th division. This shows how much Byakuya has changed over time as he allows Rukia to advance based on her own merits, granting her a sense of personal autonomy instead of treating her like his property. During the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Byakuya's growth as a character had reached its peak. In particular, during the first Quincy invasion, Asnod had easily defeated Byakuya with the power of his own Bankai. But during the second invasion, after having healed,
healed and trained with the Zero Division, both Byakuya and Rukia had grown so much stronger. Rukia was doing well in a fight against Asnod until he had transformed into his holy form. Now it's at that point that Byakuya had appeared and supported Rukia by giving her advice and offering his encouragement without interfering in the battle itself. Now this was a significant step forward in comparison to his overbearing way of protecting her in the past. He had in fact let her fight the enemy who had previously defeated him and brought him to the brink of death. Byakuya showcases his growth by standing alongside Rukia and supporting her, putting aside his own pride and fulfilling his promise to Hisana by treating Rukia as his own sister. Now the following events is what truly cements the evolution of their bond. After Rukia defeats the Stenritter with the devastating power of her own Bankai, Byakuya approaches her and calmly guides her through her Bankai's deactivation. He tells her that he had sensed her spiritual pressure on his way to the Soul Society from the Soul King's palace. He then compliments her by stating that she has grown quite powerful. As he turns around, he calls to her and tells her to come along with him so that they can protect the Soul Society. Now this means that for the first time, Byakuya wasn't looking at her as a reminder of his past mistakes, nor was she his pride, but now he had seen her as a fellow protector of the Soul Society. In this moment, Rukia had become Byakuya's equal. In summary, the relationship between Byakuya and Rukia was complex and ever evolving, and in the end, Kubo was able to tie together all of the loose ends, allowing us to see Byakuya's growth from an overbearing protector to a mentor unequal to Rukia. And in my opinion, this is truly remarkable. And it's a testament to how great Kubo is at character writing. In this relationship dynamic, he had proved that even the most stubborn of characters can change and develop into a better person. This is one of the most iconic bonds throughout the story of Bleach, and I've really enjoyed dissecting and analyzing the development of both Rukia and Byakuya. Let me know all of your thoughts what did you think about how Byakuya had behaved towards Rukia at the start of the story? And do you feel like Kubo was able to convincingly convey his development as a character by the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, where he was able to treat Rukia as an equal and demonstrate how far both of these characters have come? I would love to know all of your thoughts on this specific character dynamic, so definitely continue the discussion in the comments. And lastly, thank you for making it to the end of yet another Bleach Explained video, and I can't wait to see you in my next video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.